Praise the Lord. All right, stop as we as we pray together. A God will help us as we come together for the Bible study tonight. That He'll grant us understanding in the Word. Close your eyes and open your mouth and begin to pray. We we'll come to a new section of the book of Daniel tonight. I want to pray that the Lord will give you real understanding in the Word and make the Word very plain and very clear to your heart and apply it to your life as well. That God will grant you the same concentration as well as the same consecration that Daniel had that God had to favor him in making such a great revelation of his mind, his truth unto him, that the Lord will give you interest in his word, a desire to know, a desire to understand what the Lord has for us and what he has for you in particular in the understanding and the study of his word. Let's pray that the Spirit of God that guides His church to all truth will be mightily present in our midst and guide us to the truth, the understanding of the truth that we have revealed in His Word. God appreciates your coming every week like this. We we'll pray that you're coming every week will not make you so familiar with his presence and his word that you will not give the attention that God expects to his word. The favor of God that has brought us together, the mercy of God that has brought us together, the goodness of God that has brought us together, wanting to reveal his mind. Unto us, because we are precious and dear unto him. Jesus said, blessed are your ears for what you hear. And your eyes for what you see. For the kings and the priests. And the princes and the prophets of this world. Have desired to hear and to see, to learn, to understand. The things to hear, the things to see, the things to learn, the things we are made to understand. And they have not been able to. Why don't you thank and praise the Lord then for the special favor, privilege he has granted you. As we are praying for ourselves here, let's pray for others who are joining in with us. In various study locations across this nation and other countries in our continent, Africa, and beyond, in Britain, in Europe, in America, everywhere, learning with us that the same spirit of understanding the Lord is granting us here. I'll grant unto them. Let's pray that the study of the word will have a great impact in our lives. Will make a great difference between us and others who are ignorant of the mind of God, of the truth of the scriptures. Let's pray that this word, the living word, We lead us to salvation in Christ. We lead us to sanctification, sanctified by the truth. We lead us to commitment, surrender, consecration, yieldedness unto the Lord. That the study of the word will equip us and prepare us to be capable, competent, effective, effectual ministers. In the kingdom, that through what we know, a fire will burn within us. That the passion, desire, interest, enthusiasm to take the word 
to take it to other people. Just pray that God will give us a deep, deep desire for the salvation of others. The interest to see others saved. The interest to see others brought into the kingdom. That God will use us to be a light teaching other people, instructing other people, leading them to the depths of the knowledge of the truth that will bring them to the experience of salvation in Christ and will lead them to deeper part participation of the glory and the power of the Lord. The Word always works effectually Effectively, where the word is believed, accepted, and where there is a commitment, a consecration to live by the word. I'm sure you want the word of God to work effectively, effectually in your heart, in your life. Pray that it will be so. That God will grant you. That faith, commitment to the word, that will accept the word and make it to have a fruitful ministry in your heart and life. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Almighty God, we just thank you. We always appreciate the fact of your love for us. Moses said unto the children of Israel, What nation is there among all the nations so precious to God that he reveals his mind, his way, his word unto them? And we can say the same thing. What other group of people is so fortunate and favored, blessed, that is so near unto you that you reveal your mind, your truth, your word, and the depth of the mysteries of the kingdom unto you? We praise your name and glorify you because of this special privilege that you have given us. And we pray we'll never lose the privilege in Jesus' name. We're here once again tonight. We want to hear from you. We want your spirit to lead us into your truth. And whatever it is to have for us as individuals, as families, as local churches, as the whole church together, whatever you have for us in the study of tonight, reveal to every heart in Jesus' name. We pray that this word will make us strong. Strong in the Lord and give us a real backbone that will be able to stand in all the trials and the troubles and tribulations of life in Jesus' name. That Lord, you open, you open our eyes to see our heart to understand and there will be a desire within us that whatever commandment we find in your word will obey those commandments in Jesus name whatever warnings we find in your word will heed the warnings in Jesus name and whatever promises we find in the word we're going to look at those promises and stand on the promises that will never fail in Jesus name and then the prophecy you are revealing to us in your word, we are going to take hold of those prophecies and make sure that we are not left behind when Christ will come in Jesus' name. Bless all your people together tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can get seated. We come to the book of Daniel, but this time we're going to look at something that looks a little bit different from what we've been looking at. We've been studying chapters 1 to 6. And now we've come to the conclusion of chapter 6. And all that deals with something we call historical. It's talking about the history of different people of Babylon, of, Bel of Belshazzar, of Nebuchadnezzar, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the end of Daniel, and some other people. And we've seen a lot and learned a lot from the historical part of Daniel. As you come to chapter 7, you come to something very different. This side is prophetic. That is the last six chapters, chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. You have the prophecies of the things of the kingdoms of the world from the time of 
Nebuchadnezzar all through to the time of the coming of the Lord. Isn't that a very long time? You're thinking about the coming of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and the Middle Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire. You're thinking about the Romans too and you're thinking about all that until the very end of time. That's a very wide sweep of time. A very long period of time. And in this uh, chapter 7, Daniel begins telling us about the things that he is uh, going to reveal according to the prophecy of the word that came unto him. And you'll find in the first part of the book that he is in chapters 1 to 6. There were some dreams, some visions too, but they were not the dreams and visions of Daniel. They were the dreams and the visions of Nebuchadnezzar. And then the writing on the wall for Belshazzar. In those cases, it was Daniel that was used of God to come and make the interpretation unto them, both unto Nebuchadnezzar as well as unto Belshazzar. In the case of Daniel, he had dreams, he had visions of his own, which you'll find from chapter 7, chapter 8, and then chapter 10, and chapter 11, and chapter 12. And in some case, it wasn't another person that came to interpret his dreams and visions to him. It was an angel from heaven that came to interpret those visions and give him an understanding of what his visions and dreams actually signified. And then as you look at all these things, they choose a lot of symbols. And you need to be very, very vigilant. And then you compare scripture with scripture so you can understand all those things that he tells us in these prophetic writings of Daniel. We're opening our Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 7. Reading from verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Stop there for a moment. You see, when you read the Bible, you need to understand. He dates the time of the vision. And he's telling you something. And there's something we call in the Bible chronology. That means following after one another in the matter of time. And many people, because they do not understand the Bible, or they do not look very closely into the Bible, they do not understand that, uh, you know, there are some chapters you'll find here that actually had occurred before the things were studied. Look at that verse again. In the first year of Belshazzar, I thought Belshazzar is dead. Yes, you are right. First year of Belshazzar. That means that this vision came to Daniel before Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Because it was in Daniel chapter 5 that we have the last year of Belshazzar. That was the chapter that reveals the death of Belshazzar. But in this case now this dream or this vision came to Belshazzar, in the, to Daniel in the first year of Belshazzar. That means that as we look at Daniel what Daniel did is this. He collected all the historical parts onto one side. And then we're saying Daniel didn't you have any vision of your own? Yes, I do. Don't you have any dream of your own? Yes, I do. Where are they? I'm going to write about them when I finish all the historical parts. That's why he had finished chapters 1 to 6 before now talking about the visions and the dreams that he had. Come back again, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Then Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of, of, of the heaven strove upon the, of, upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, divers one from another. And now Daniel said, I had a dream. And the dream actually is giving us a vision. And the vision is that of a prophecy that is giving us a prophecy. Daniel, what did you see? I saw the winds. And then watch, and the sea. And the winds were striving together. There was a great consternation. There was a great commotion. There was a great conflict upon the sea. And all right, Daniel, what else did you see? I saw animals. I saw beasts. And they were coming out of 
do of that sea. And then all those animals were divers one from another. Daniel, now you must tell us, what kind of beasts or animals did you see? I'm reading from verse 4. And the first was like a lion, an arch eagle's wings I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and man's heart was given to it. Now you must follow very uh, slowly. It is said, I saw the first animal, the first beast, and the beast looks like uh, a lion. And that lion, as I looked at it, I saw that he stood upon his feet like a man. Not only that, I saw that a man's heart was given to that lion. That's telling you something. It's talking about as, as somebody now that had a change. He was furious and he was violent and he was dangerous and deadly like a lion. And yet he had the heart of a man. We'll come back to that in verse 5. And behold, another beast, the second, a second, like a bear. And it raised up itself on the one side. And it had three ribs in the mouth of each. Between the teeth of it, he said, I saw another beast, another animal. And that animal is like a bear. And by the time I saw that animal, I could say something, I could understand something. He had three ribs in his mouth, which tells me that he had gone to destroy some other animals. And he has their ribs now in his mouth. And then it says, and this said, Thus unto it arise and devour much flesh. He said, this animal I saw actually was very destructive, causing the death of much of many, other, many others. In verse 6, after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of, upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. He said, now, I saw something strange. Did I tell you I saw a lion? Did I tell you I saw a, le a, a bear? Then I saw a leopard. But a leopard normally is an animal that, is, that has four feet and doesn't fly. But this one, I saw that it had four wings of a fowl. Which means that this one will be faster than ordinary animal. Will fly, literally. Which means then it will be a kind of destructive animal, but it will destroy speedily. It tells us, and the beast had four, four heads, and dominion was given unto it. It's telling us now that it's a kind of animal, not the one you find in the forest, the one you find in the city, the one you find in the palace, the one that will reign and rule and have dominion over others. Then in verse 7, after this, I saw in the night vision. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse, different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them them another little hand before whom there were three or three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in this hand were eyes like the eyes of man and in mouth speaking great things daniel said that's what i saw that's the vision that was revealed unto me. To start with, before we uh, get into the detailed understanding of that passage, we're looking at beasts. As you look at the Bible, you'll find that uh, bees actually were made to represent people many times. You know, when Jesus Christ was talking about Herod, and somebody said, Herod is going to get you, and he's going to kill you. Jesus said, go and tell that fox. And was talking about the king, about Herod, which means then that the kings of the world were sometimes represented by bees, animals. Let's look at Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. We're looking at verse twelve. Second Peter chapter two. Looking at verse twelve. But these, as natural brute beasts, 
made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. This tells you something now. Peter was talking about people, about sinners, polluted people, corrupted people, and he was talking about abominable people. He was talking about sinful people. And he said they're like brute beasts. And they'll be destroyed by the judgment of God. And then he says that the evil speak evil of the things they know not. Look at Jude. In Jude verse 10. Jude verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know as nat naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. It's talking about people, and Jude said, don't mind them, they're just like brute beasts. They're like a violent and terrible, deadly animals. And so you understand, whenever we read about all these, the lion and the bear and the leopard and the other one that was so terrible and diverse and different from every other beast, we're actually talking about people. We're looking at Psalm 57. In Psalm 57, I'm reading from verse, reading from verse 4. Psalm 57, reading from verse 4. My soul is among lions. And he's talking about people. Here is David now. He said, there's many persecutors around me. Many enemies around me. And they're breathing, they're breathing kind of a few mean smoke and fire. Wanting to destroy me. And my soul is among the lions. And I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men. He said, I'm not talking about lions in the bush, in the forest. I'm talking about people that are like lions. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows. And their tongue is sharp sword. Well, then you understand what we have read in Daniel. That was actually talking about kings, about emperors about princes and these ones appeared unto him like brute beasts and in chapter 7 and 8 daniel gives an accurate portrayal of the history of the great world emperors which you have seen now and their empires the details of the rise and the fall of alexander the great will come to that and at antiochus the greek it says, uh, leading to the revelation of the Antichrist. You'll find as we read and study, well, that's where you look at chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 11. You'll find Alexander the Great very, pictured very well. Not only really that, number two, Antiochus, Epiphanes, not only really that, number three, the Antichrist will come at the end of time. You'll find the picture described very clearly. And this is what reaching even before any of them was born. And so you know that it's only God that could have revealed that. Of course, God knows everything that will happen before they ever happen. Look at Psalm, look at Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. Remember, the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. You see that? Declaring the end, the things that have not been yet. Declaring them from the very beginning. That's the Almighty God. And then it says, and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 18. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 18. It says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Nothing ever comes by surprise unto God. All those wicked kings that arise, all those brute beasts that arise up, all those violent emperors and kings and princes that rise up and persecute the people of God and destroy the children of Israel and lead them into real trial, trouble and tribulation. All the things they were supposed to do, God knew everything ahead of time. Known unto God are all his works from the foundation of the world. And that's what we're looking at here tonight, the, the remarkable prophecy of world empires. Tonight we're going to divide our study to three parts. Number one, the fierce sea of battling gentile kingdoms. 
the fear sea, the sea where you have the commotion and the conflict of these Gentile kingdoms. Number two, the four symbolic beasts for the Gentile kings. Those beasts that were read about, symbolic of those Gentile kingdoms. We're going to see what we need to learn about them. Then number four, the fourth, the final strange beast of the Gentile kings or kingdom. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We're looking at verses 1 and 2. The very beginning of the vision, the revelation that God showed unto Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the psalm of the matters. Daniel's dream and vision came to him in the first year of Belshazzar before the account written in chapter 5. He had this dream much before his experience in the lion's den, which took place in uh, chapter 6. This dream which Daniel wrote down was no ordinary dream. It is of great significance. In the first six chapters, Daniel wrote in the third person. He'll say, he, he dreamt, he called, he said, he made a decree, he wrote in the third person. But in all these uh, chapters now from chapter 7, he wrote in the first person, I had a dream. I, I sought for the interpretation. An angel came unto me, and the angel said unto me, and then I fainted because of the impact of that dream. And I was sick in certain days because the dream of the vision made me sick. He wrote in the first person in the last six chapters, from chapter 7 all through to chapter 12. In his vision, Daniel saw four winds of the heavens striving upon the great sea. When it says four, I'm sure you remember when we mentioned four, the north and the south and the east and the west. That's the four. And when you're looking at those cardinal points of the world, you're looking at the four, you're looking at the four directions of the world. That's what he meant when he said, I saw the wind from the four corners of the earth and it strove together. The striving of those uh, four winds have reference to the conflicts and the commotion from all directions on the earth and the unrest and the agitation on the sea of humanity. When we're talking about the sea, the sea, that's what Daniel said there. I saw the winds striving together on the sea. The sea, what does that mean? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 17. Isaiah chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 12, I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapters, chapter 17, verse 12. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. Can you connect those things together? Many people and then the seas. It says they make a noise. They, they shout and then they run in. It's like the roaring of the sea. But God shall rebuke them and, shall, and they shall flee off. And it says and shall be chased as the chaff, as the chaff of the mountains before the wind. And like a roaring thing before the whirlwind. That's in verse 13. And so in verse 12, at the latter part of verse 12, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. So then you understand when Daniel spoke about the wind striving together and striving together upon the tumultuous sea. He's talking about the sea of humanity. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Reading from verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far. And will hiss unto them from the edge of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary, nor stumble among them. None shall slumber, nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loose, nor the latch latch of their shoes be broken. Listen to this, number 28, whose arrows are sharp. And all their bows bent. He's talking about warriors. He's talking about an, an army. An army of 
great people, strong uh, soldiers, and uh, militant soldiers, and their horses' hooves shall be counted like the flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. It's talking about the wind, and it's talking about these people who are soldiers and the army of the enemy. And then it says in verse 29, their running shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. Verse 30, and in that day. They shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. It's talking about soldiers, talking about an army, talking about warriors, talking about those who are in battle, in conflict against another nation. And it says they shall roar like the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. And so you understand then what Daniel was talking about. He was talking about the commotion. And about the conflict, about the battle, about the evil things, the destruction that will come upon the world as the kings and their kingdoms and the emperors and the empires will be fighting against one another. I pray that in all this conflict and commotion of the people of the world, the Lord will keep us in the hollow of his hand. And he will keep us safe from all their trouble and trials and all their tribulations in Jesus' name. When you put your security, you put your life in God. All these things, you know they are going to happen. But they will not bother you. Because you know you are in the hollow of his hand. And the Lord will protect you perfectly in Jesus' name. We are looking at Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. I am reading from verse 31 and verse 32. Then it is talking about the wind. And it's talking about that the wind striving together. And it's talking about, about the sea. And it's talking about the bees and the animals that came out of the sea. And it says, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about the natural sea or the natural wind. I'm talking about what they represent. That's why we come to Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 31 and 32. Verse 31. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. Says the Lord. That means that when he gives them to the sword. He's talking about the wicked. About the sinners. About those who are rebellious and disobedient against the God of heaven. Their creator. And God says he'll give them to the sword. He'll give them into the hands of the destroyers. And then he says in verse 32. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Behold evil shall go forth from nation to nation. And a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. The wind, the whirlwind, there is referring to the battle that will come and the destruction that will come upon the children of men. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6 verses 22 and 23. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 22. Thus says the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on the bow and spear. They shall they are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. Do you see that? And that's why I told you that uh, Daniel was using just a pictorial language as the Lord showed him the vision, the revelation of the winds, the whirlwind, and the sea, and the bees. And he says it's going to be an army, a dangerous army, a deadly army, a kind of violent people that will come. And it says over there in verse 23, and they shall lay hold of the bow and the spear they are cruel and they have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. And they ride upon the horses and search in array as men for war against the O daughter of Zion. And then in chapter 50, Jeremiah chapter 50, we're reading from verse 41. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 41. You see, when you read scripture, to make scripture compare with scripture, 
all those symbols become very clear to you. And it's not just somebody saying, well, this passage that we're reading, I think that, I feel that, I suggest, I, I suppose maybe it is like this. There's no supposition. The word of God is very clear. And you'll not be in any doubt as to compare scripture with scripture that the wind or the wild wind or the sea or the bees is talking about those great kings that will come. The kings of the world, of world empires that will fight against one another and destroy many people in battle. And then they'll establish themselves by violent jaws like the animals in the forest. They kind of get themselves settled by destroying other animals. In Jeremiah chapter 50, reading from verse 41. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and they shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon the horses, every one put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. You understand now? Babylon was reigning. Babylon was cruel. Babylon destroyed other nations. And now the Lord is saying, another animal is going to rise up. You are an animal. You are beastly and you are brutish and you are wicked and you are violent. And you think you are the most powerful and the most violent animal. Another animal will rise up in battle against you. And then will destroy your daughter of Babylon. In verse 43, the king of Babylon has heard the report of them. And his sons wax feeble, anguish took hold of him, and pants as of a woman in, in travail. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan unto the habitation of the strong. But I will make them suddenly run away from her, who is a chosen man, that I may appoint over her. For who is like me, and who will appoint me the time? And who is the shepherd that will stand before me? The Lord was saying there that the destruction of Babylon will come, but there is an appointed time when that will take Take place. It tells us in chapter 51 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 51. I'm reading from verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 51. We're looking at verse 14. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter. Like rams with he goats. How is Sheshach taken? And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? In verse 42, the sea is come up upon Babylon. You understand that now? The sea, the sea of humanity. That means thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers. And when Babylon saw the soldiers, it was like a sea of hairs. Very, very many. The sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. And then Ezekiel, just like Jeremiah has prophesied about the sea, about the wind, and about the army that will come upon Babylon, so also Ezekiel prophesied in chapter 26, verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 3. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Otiros, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea that causes these waves to come up. He's talking about the nations that will come up, and then he says, they're like the sea. Even the New Testament tells us the same thing, that people and nations and tongues and languages are regarded like the sea. Let's come to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, and I'm reading there from verse 15. Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And he says unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where, where the war seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and 
tongues. That makes it very clear beyond any shadow of doubt in anybody's mind that Daniel saw the wind, the sea, the bees coming out of that sea and he's talking about the multitudes of people, the multitudes of warriors, the multitudes of enemies and the multitudes of destroyers that will come upon one another and destroy one another. Let's come back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 1. Now you have a clearer understanding. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. Upon the great sea. That means then that the people of the world, like the troubled sea, they cannot have rest. Our rest is only in Christ. Our rest is only in the Lord. And even though we're talking about uh, the Babylonian government and the Grecian government and the Middle Persian government and the Roman government, we also can talk about the sinners because the sinners are also like the troubled sea. Look at, look at it in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57, and I'm reading there from verse 20. The wicked are like the troubled sea. The troubled sea. Yes, Daniel saw all the troubled sea, the kingdoms of the world. But you know, in every little kingdom, in every little community, in every little family, in fact, in every little heart, you have a kingdom. And if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the turbulence and the violence there and the restlessness there. Look at verse 20 and it says, The wicked are like a troubled sea which cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says the Lord to the wicked. That means then, if you do not know the Lord, you'll be like these ones that were reading about that there is no peace to the wicked. Wicked. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 22. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. I'm coming to the New Testament now in Jude. We're looking at Jude. We're talking about the people that do not know God and are like the brute beasts. And their lives have turbulence. And their lives are violent. There is no rest and there is no peace in their hearts. And if you look at Jude verse 12, these are sports in your feasts of charity. When the feast which you feed in themselves without fear, clouds they are without water carried about of winds, trees whose fruits withereth without fruit twice dead. And it says plucked up by the roots. Do you see it likens them to the violet winds there in verse 12, in verse 13? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's talking about the unbeliever who does not know God, and because he doesn't have Christ, he doesn't have peace. How can the turbulence be calmed? How can the raging of the sea in the life of the sinner, how can that be calmed? It can be calmed as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is our peace. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. For he is our peace. If you want the turbulence of your heart and the restlessness of your soul and the dissatisfaction in your life to come to rest, you come to the Lord Jesus Christ because it is He that gives us that peace. It says, For He is our peace who has made both of both one, who has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. It tells us in John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14 verse 27 Peace I leave with you My peace I give unto you Not as the world giveth I give, give I unto you Let not your heart be troubled Neither let it be afraid Come to Christ And God will grant you peace In Christ Jesus 
and that peace will calm your soul. The restlessness will vanish away. And then you understand the Lord himself will take control. He rule over the kingdom of your heart and of your life. And we're talking about now the world. Because Daniel saw all those emperors and kingdoms of the world. And there was no peace. And at last Jesus Christ will come. When Christ comes, there will be peace in this world. Before that time, there's no peace in the world. There'll be war, nation fighting against nation, and kingdom fighting against kingdom, because the sea of the world is going to be turbulent until Christ comes. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I'm reading there from verse 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us his son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. Tell me the rest. The Prince of Peace. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes, that's only when the turbulence of this world will vanish away. And it says in verse 7, Of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're coming now to point number two, the four symbolic beasts of the, for the Gentile kings. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. Now Daniel had said, I saw the sea. You remember that's the sea of humanity. Human beings all looking like a sea of heads. And out of the sea of humanity, I saw four of them coming out. And the force was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth. And made to stand upon his feet like as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Daniel should not have any kind of doubt concerning that lion because actually the symbol that the emblem that uh, Nebuchadnezzar used with Babylon was a symbol of the emblem of a lion. And so Daniel should not have any doubt about that, that that was the kingdom of the Babylonians depicted and represented and emblematic of the lion. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. And I'm reading there from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 4. We're reading there from verse 7. That the Lord was revealing something to Daniel and he had no doubt about the revelation that the Lord was giving unto him. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7. The lion is come up from his ticket. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. That's, that's Nebuchadnezzar. That's uh, Babylon. It says, is the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He's gone forth from his place to make the land desolate. And thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Look at verse 13. Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and these chariots shall be be as a one wind, his horses are swifter than eagles worn to us, we are, for we are spoiled. He's talking about the ambition that Nebuchadnezzar or the Babylonians will have against the people of God and against all those nations and rouge them. And he said he's coming, he's violent, he's furious, he's forceful and woe unto us because nobody will be able to stand before this great lion, the lion-hearted man that was coming. And we're looking at, we're looking at uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. Talking about the lion that Daniel spoke about. Habakkuk chapter 1. We're looking at verse 6. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not 
theirs. That is, they will be so violent and take away what does not belong to them. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. And they shall fly as the eagle that hastes to eat. You see that the lion in, in the Daniel's revelation or Daniel's vision or Daniel's dream are two wings of an eagle very, very fast to destroy. In Habakkuk chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also, because he transgresses by wine, is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, and gathereth unto him all nations, and he heapeth unto him all people. He's talking about the greed and the covetousness that Nebuchadnezzar had, and all those other kingdoms had, because they just wanted to destroy other nations, and possess their land, and possess their riches, and possess their wealth, and possess their treasures. In verse 6, shall not all these take up a parable against him, and he taunt him proverb against him, and say woe to him that increaseth that which is not his, how long, and, and to him that layeth, that layeth himself with a thick claim, shall they not rise up suddenly, that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shall be for booties unto them. It's talking about uh, eventually uh, that lion and that, uh, uh, that violent person and that violent emperor is going to be destroyed. It tells us in verse 8, because thou hast punished many nations, all the remnants of the people shall spoil thee, and because of men's blood, and for the violence of, of the land, of the city, and of, 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 the, of all that dwell therein, woe to him that covereth an evil, coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, and that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul. That was a rebuke concerning that wicked king and that wicked emperor that had done that, destroying them, destroying other nations so that he could build on the destruction, on the death and devastation of other nations. Let's come back to uh, chapter 7 of Daniel. Chapter 7 of Daniel. We have read about the lion. We have read about the Be- about Nebuchadnezzar. We have read about the Babylonian king that destroyed others. Now he's going to go to another. We're looking at verse 5 of chapter 7. And behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth, in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Here now Daniel saw another one that destroyed the first. The lion now is out of the way. And now we have a bear. That means the Babylonian kingdom is out of the way. And we know what took over. We know the empire that took over. That's the Middle Persian Empire. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse, reading from verse 25. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many take care of you for sin. This is the interpretation of the scene. Many, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. That was the age of the Babylonian government. Babylonian Empire. The Lord numbered them, weighed them, evaluated them, examined them, and finished them up. His judgment came upon them. In verse 27, take it, thou art weighed in the balances, and thou art found wanting. In verse 28, Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. 
giving to the ladies and the patients. That means that's the, uh, that's the beer there that had two sides. And it says in Bastachi, and in that night was Belshazzar the king of uh, the Chaldean slain. Then Bastachi won and Darius, and uh, the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old, 62 years old. That means another kingdom took over. Let's look at Daniel chapter 8. There are another vision that he saw, and he saw the same thing, how this uh, side, this Middle Persian government took over from the Babylonian government. Chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Chapter 8, verse 3 of Daniel. Then I lifted up my eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram with two horns. And, one, and the two horns were high, and one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. It's talking about the Middle Persian government again. Look at verse 20, you'll see the interpretation there. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And that was a kingdom that took over from this uh, Babylonian empire. We're looking at Osea chapter, Osea chapter 13. Osea chapter 13. And we're going to see something of the beard there. In Osea chapter 13, we're looking at verse 8. Osea chapter 13, looking at verse 8. I will meet them as a beard that is bereaved of her webs, and will wrench the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild bees shall tear them. So he's talking about the conquest that they will have, the destruction that they will cause. Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13. Babylon thought they were so strong, they were so mighty, and it was so kind of impregnable, unconquerable, that no other kingdom could conquer them. Because Belsh uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar felt, we are the lion and the king of the forest. And there's no other beast or no other animal or no other emperor or king can confront us. But eventually Babylon came down. The proud will come down. And those who say there is no God, and they think they're all in all. And they think they're independent of God. And because of what they think they have or what they think they can do. And they think that nobody can challenge them. They will come down. Yeah. But the people of God will be lifted up in Jesus' name. Yeah. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13 verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the medis against them. Which shall not regard silver and as for gold. They shall not delight in it. And the prophecy had been there that God will raise up those Middle Persian armies and soldiers and they'll bring Babylon down. Let's come back to Daniel now, chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We have read verse 4 talking about the lion that's uh, about Babylon. We have read verse 5 talking about the beard. That's talking about the Middle Persian government. We're now going to read the next one, which is verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which arch upon its back four wings. And of, of a fowl, the beast arch also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. Dominion was given unto it. That means Middle Persia will clear out of the way. You know, when Middle Persia got there, they thought they were all in all. Every kingdom that always uh, that came, they always thought we are all in all. When Babylon was there, we are all in all. Nobody can challenge us, and we are there forever. But God finished them. And when Middle Persian came, they said, Our decree is a decree that altereth not. We're there forever. And our laws are there forever. It's unchangeable because we are immovable. God moved them out of the way. They persecuted the people of God, you know. They persecuted the children of Israel. And they thought, there's nothing anybody can do. We are the people in power. It's just like maybe your little life as a child of God. There's somebody there trying to press you and persecute you. And he says, we are there and nobody can move us. Before too long, they are going to be moved away. 
And God is going to deliver them into the hand of greater powers than themselves in Jesus' name. And the people of God will live on in Jesus' name. Can I just remind you, Babylon is gone, but Israel is still there. Medo-Persia is gone and Israel is still there. And then the Grecian people that came, Alexander the Great, that man was violent and terrible and fast. And he conquered the whole world by the age of 26. Alexander the Great, he even started as the son of Philip of Macedonia. And he started at the age of 20. Can you imagine that? And then he was so fast and furious. And he conquered at the age of 26. By the age of 30, 32, he sat and wept because there was no other person to conquer. He was just thirsty to conquer. By the age of 33, he died. He led and Israel is still there. I'm telling you, no matter how powerful the enemy is, and they say we're there, and we're forever there, and there's nothing that little child of God can do, I'm telling you, we have a God who lives forever. And because he lives, we shall live in Jesus' name. And when all those persecutors and enemies are forgotten, we shall still be standing on our feet of prayer and faith, standing on the promises of God, we shall never be moved in Jesus' name. But now Babylon is gone, the lion is gone, Middle Persia is gone, the, the bear is gone, and now the leopard comes. We're looking at verse 6. In verse 6, after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. Let's look at chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 8. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. For it for each came for notable ones be, uh, toward the four winds of heaven. This is talking about Greece. How do you know that? I thought you said we must not say. I suppose. I feel. I think. I guess. No, there's no guessing here. Look at verse twenty and verse twenty-one. You'll see that it was Babylon first. Number two, the Middle Persian Empire. Then number three, it was Greece that took over from the Middle Persian Empire. No guessing. No thinking. No feeling. No supposition. Just the word of God. Verse twenty. The ram which thou sawest. Having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Look at verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes, the first kings. And then it says it will be broken. It will be destroyed. That power too will get out of the way in Jesus' name. Let's look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 verse 20. No matter how strong a kingdom might appear to be, and no matter how fast a kingdom might appear to be, if they do not know God, they will come down at last. And then the people that know God, they will do great exploits and will stand and abide forever in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou whereof I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, Persia force. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. That means that after the kingdom of uh, Persia, then you are going to have the king of Greece. Now, let, let's, let's bring a summary. Look at your notes now. It says, and the four great beasts came up. The gentle kings and their kingdoms are represented by beasts because they often rise to rule and to reign by brutish rage and tyranny. These beasts are diverse from one another, different, different in appearance and different in strategies and different in military genius. The force represented by a lion with wings is the Babylonian king. The lion-hearted warrior king was fast and furious and fierce. He fought and conquered many nations with great rapidity, with great speed. He was daring and deadly, cruel and courageous. He ruled with beastly brutality until he was judged and conquered by divine omnipotence. The second beast is a bear. And it's symbolizing, symbolizing the Middle Persian kingdom. Though inferior to the Babylonian government, it was still beastly and brutal, oppressive and 
within us. Raised up on one side, the Persian side was stronger than the Medes in his voraciousness. It has three reeves in his mouth. That is, he had conquered Egypt and Lydia and Babylon. That's why it says he had those three reeves, wicked and cruel. The Middle Persian kingdom rose and conquered and devout much, but eventually again was brought down and got out of the way. The third beast, a leopard, represented the Grecian kingdom. Instead of two wings, the leopard had four wings, symbolizing its great speed and swiftness. This winged leopard symbolized Alexander the Great, the Grecian king. He was swift and powerful. He conquered the whole empire of Persia and other nations within 13 years. I told you he started to rule at the age of 20 and then he died at the age of 33, 13 years. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given unto it when he died at the age of 33. His empire was divided and uh, divided up among three of his chief captains. The first beast was more fierce than any other the world had ever seen. Let's look at verse 7 of uh, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We're looking at verse 7. After this I, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth it devout and break in pieces and stamped the residue over the feet of it and it was it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. You see when a Greece was there, when Alexander the Great was there, because of the rapidity by which he conquered the world, he thought again I am there and none else. I'll never be moved. But he was moved and the Roman government, the Roman Empire took over. I pray that we will depend upon the Lord. Because the people who are proud and sufficient in themselves were seen that in the days of their strength, in the days of their power, in the days of their authority and domination, they saw that nobody could move them. But eventually, God moved them away. Isn't that what, he, what we have seen in history? There's a time that Pharaoh was there and he said, who is that God? I don't know that God, but he was taken away. Another time, it was the king of Syria, Sennacherib. He was there and he said, don't let Hezekiah de de kind of deceive you that I will not conquer you. I am coming with my army and the doors of the land of Israel will not be sufficient for my army. One night that scenario died and that was all. And you remember Herod? Herod was there. Kill all those children. I don't want anybody to rise up that to rule and take the power from me. Again Herod died. And one by one by one like that, they have gone. But Jesus remains alive. And it says, because I live, ye shall live also. And if you want to live forever in the joy, in the peace, and the strength of the Lord, depend upon the Lord. If you depend upon the people of the world because they are rich, because they are wealthy, because they are mighty, because they are great, when they are gone, you will go with them. But if you will remain with the Lord Jesus Christ, he will never be moved. Is from everlasting to everlasting. And because his dominion is forever and ever, if you are with the Lord, you'll be forever and ever. Those commanders and the armies of the Roman Empire, they were dreadful and terrible. They were strong with iron, the iron empire, and they conquered the world with brutal, irresistible force. This godless world is always hoping that a good leader, a good king will arise to replace a current cruel one. That is the hope of the world. Is any time election is coming up in any nation, they're saying, aha, uh -huh, uh, this wicked one is going. This terrible one is going. The economy is down. This one is down. The next one coming, we're sure. It's going to change everything. And then that next one comes. It doesn't matter which country. That next kingdom, he comes and then we say, ah, looks like even the person we're complaining about was better. This one is terrible. There is no food to eat. There is no water to drink. And there is no fuel to put in a vehicle. And there is nothing. This is terrible. Now, then somebody will come up again and say, don't worry, I'm coming. Vote for me. Once I'm there, everything will change. And then they lift up your hope again. And then you vote for him and you say, what are we looking at? We even 
the one who are complaining about before that was even mal. This one is terrible. Don't worry, Jesus will come at last. And when Jesus comes at last, then he'll change everything. And then at that time, there'll be peace for everybody. There'll be joy, satisfaction, or satisfy the need of every soul in Jesus' name. And look at chapter 7. I'm going to tell, I'm going to show you chapter 7. Look at verse 14. And when Daniel kept on looking at the vision, eventually Christ came. Christ will come. I said, Christ will come. Look at verse 13 of chapter 7. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like who? Like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom, and all people and nations and languages shall serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's the best part of the vision. All the other visions of the lion and the leopard and the bear and the divers and the fierce animal. All those visions, if that is all we have, we are lost. If that's all we have, there will be no joy. If that's all we have, there's no hope. But thank God that's not all we have. The Son of Man is coming. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the mediator, Jesus Christ, the priest is coming. He has come to our hearts already. And because it's your heart in your life, you'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Let's wrap up the kingdom of these wicked people. Now, point number three, the final strange beast of the Gentile kings. The final strange beast of the Gentile king. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a, f- a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great, hun- great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I, I-, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this son were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now, Daniel said, I never saw anything like this before. I've been seeing animals, and I've been seeing them having horns. I've never seen an animal having ten horns at the same time. I've never seen an animal having an eye in the horn. I've never seen an animal having mouth in the horn. And the mouth was not just there for decoration. The mouth was even speaking, and speaking great things. Anybody knows that the horn represents the strength and the power. When you see animals fighting, animals don't fight with their legs. They fight with their horn. And when they lock horns together, that means a real and fierce, terrible battle. And it says that this particular animal, this particular beast, it will have strength. It will have the strength and insight and intelligence. There will be eyes that see. Eyes that see to understand that is intelligence, that is knowledge, that is understanding in the strength. It will not just be like a, like a kind of strength that is not intelligence. It will have intelligence. And then mouth that speaks, it will also have the ability and the capacity to communicate. Have you noticed that the kings of the world, if they know how to communicate very well, that's how they are voted for. It's not how much you know, it's how much you're able to communicate. And the people of the world were run after the people that can speak, that have great ability to communicate. And then it says that this king that will arise, the fourth one, which will actually arise out of the Roman Empire, will have intelligence, will have understanding, will have knowledge, will have 
diplomacy. He'll have some crafty policies. And then he'll also have the ability to sway the world by the way he talks. Actually, he's a forerunner and the appearance of the Antichrist. It's like, you know, representing the Antichrist. Because when the Antichrist comes, he'll have great strength. He'll have great, great power. He'll have intelligence. He'll have real diplomacy. And also he'll have the deceptive, crafty policy that he will have. He'll be able to sway the minds of the people of the world. Let me show you in chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And I'm reading there from verse, I'm reading from verse, uh, verse 25. Uh, let's go back to verse 23. Verse 23. And in the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall arise, shall stand up. It's saying, in the latter time, this one that we have read now is representing, standing in, as the forerunner of the Antichrist. And it says the Antichrist eventually will come. He will understand dark sentences. He will be able to unravel, interpret the things that are confusing to many people. And then in verse 24, and his power shall be mighty. The horn represents the strength and the power. And it says but not by his own power. It will be like Satan demons energizing him. It will not be just natural strength, natural intelligence, educational ability because of going to school and and having a certificate, that's why he has intelligence. No, it will be a demonic kind of thing beyond the natural ability of anyone. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice. And he shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. In verse 25, and through his policy also, he shall cause craft deception, hypocrisy to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he destroy many. You see that? He will not even just use arms alone, ammunition alone. Peacefully, by peace, shall he destroy many. That means that he'll be so intelligent and he'll communicate very well that even though he's trying to kill the people and destroy them, they'll be falling down for him. By peace shall he destroy many and he shall stand up against the prince of princes. Who is the prince of princes? I said, Who is the prince of princes? Jesus Christ. He'll think that now, now that I've conquered the world, I can conquer anyone and anything. And then he'll say, I'm going to stand against the prince of princes. Read the rest, the last sentence, the last part of verse 25. But it shall be broken without hands. That's our Jesus. That's our Christ. Anyone standing against him, he'll break him without hands. Without even trying to shoot anything, the mighty power, supernatural power of the almighty God will destroy that individual in Jesus' name. And you know the information, the news I have for you, it says your life is seed with Christ in God. You are a child of God. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're studying about all these lions and leopard and bear and diverse animals. Oh, the world is terrible. And they have demonic power and evil power. What am I going to do? There's nothing you're going to do. Jesus has done everything. And when you try to stand against you, remember your life is seed with Christ in God. If they stand against you, they are standing against Christ. And anyone that stands against Christ or against you in Christ, he will be destroyed and that without the without hand. We are confident in the Lord that will deliver and will protect us. And even though the world may be passing through real trauma and trouble, trial and tribulation, we shall overcome in Jesus' name. Before we pray, I'm going to show you the word of God that shows that we have confidence in the Lord. And the Lord himself is going to stand by us and going to remain with us forever and ever in Jesus' name. We're looking at chapter 7 of Daniel. Chapter 7 of Daniel, I'm looking at verse 22. Chapter 7, verse 22. Until the ancient of days came. Are you there? Are you seeing what I'm reading? Chapter 7, verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. 
they're still, they're still doing it now. You know, Alexander the Great, he possessed it and he went and we're looking at him. And then other people, Antiochus, uh, you know, the Epiphanes, he came and he's gone. We're looking at them. But at last, Jesus will clear away all those impostors. And then the kingdom will be handed over to us. We shall reign with Christ in Jesus' name. The joy of being with the Lord. The joy of reigning with the Lord. Stay with the Lord. You are reign. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We have learned today of this great prophecy. And we have learned what God has in store for his children. You are one of the children of God. There is nothing for you to fear. The Lord is on your side. And you are going to reign with the Lord forever and ever in Jesus name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. I'm sure you are not afraid of the kingdoms of this world, of the powers of this world. I'm, I'm sure you are not afraid of the emperors of this world. I'm sure you are not afraid of the Alexanders of this world, the Antiochus of this world. I'm sure you are not afraid of the spirit of the Antichrist that is moving people, driving people, making them to want to do evil. I'm sure you are not afraid of the persecutors who are saying, we reign and we stand and there is nobody that can stand before us and is threatening the people of God. Remain in the Lord. Your life is seen with Christ in God. And when they are all destroyed, you'll keep on standing, standing in victory. Standing in victory. They come and go. They come and go. They come and go. They rise and fall. They rise and fall. They rise and fall. But Jesus remains ever. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Princes. He is our redeemer. He is our creator. He is the one that makes us new creation. He is the one that gives us life. And in his life, we shall have life. In his light, we shall see light. No matter how powerful an enemy might be, Jesus will conquer. No matter the intelligence, no matter the understanding, no matter the wealth, no matter the resources, no matter the bragging, no matter the pride of the enemy, Jesus will conquer. And you are in that Christ. Christ abides in you. You abide in Christ. The word of Christ abides in, abide in you. And you are abiding in Christ. Victory belongs to him. And victory belongs to you as well. The little, little antichrists, the little, little persecutors, the little, little lions, the little, little bears, the little, little leopards, the little, little wild beasts around may try to threaten you. Nothing for you to fear in Christ. Because the kingdom shall be delivered into the hands of the saints of the Most High. Because he conquered, you will conquer. Because he overcame, you will overcome. Kingdoms rise and fall. Yet Christ, our Lord, abides forever. At the time of the end, there will be the culmination of all the powers of the enemy injected into the Antichrist. And he will persecute the Jews terribly and devastate and destroy the world. But the church would have gone in the rapture before the coming of the Antichrist. Pray that the Lord will keep you, the Holy of His hand, keep you secured in His kingdom, keep you protected, watching over you, keep you in the fold, keep you in the kingdom of light, so that when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and the saints of God shall be caught up to go with them. You will be with the people of God. Rest in the Lord, there is nothing to fear. Abide in the Lord. He loves you. He will protect you. He will deliver you from every evil power. And preserve you unto his everlasting kingdom. Don't put your faith, your trust in any man. Rich man. Great men, powerful men, mighty men, intelligent men, 
capable men, exalted men, they are up today, they will be down tomorrow. Don't put your faith in them. Don't you put your trust in them. Put your trust 